Hi everyone, this is Jan Kabili. I'm happy that you're joining us for the Photoshop show. We have an amazing guest this week. I am just like completely in awe. I'm on the ground. I'm just writhing. I can't believe he's here. And that is John Paul Caponegro. And John Paul, did I say your name right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> 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 And that's him right down there next to me, and he's joining us from somewhere in nowhere, Italy, where we didn't even know if he'd be able to uh, to connect, but he, he has, and we're very happy. And um, we have an amazing show planned for you tonight, because not only is John Paul going to regale us with tales of Photoshop and creativity, but anybody who has been, uh, you know, unless you've been under a rock today, you have probably heard that Lightroom 4 was released today. And so we would be remiss if we didn't talk about Lightroom. And when I said that earlier to my esteemed panel down here, um, one of them said, well, but it's a Photoshop show. Why are we talking about Lightroom? And the reason is it's Photoshop Lightroom. Lightroom is just part of the Photoshop family. But before we get into all of that good stuff, I would love to have our guests and panelists introduce themselves so you know who they are and where you can find them online. So, can you just tell us in a couple of sentences, each one of you, starting with John Paul there? I'm John Paul Capnegro. I live in uh, Cushing, Maine, a little tiny town in Maine. Right now I'm in uh, Aqua Santa, Italy, uh, a little hill town on the opposite coast from Rome. Uh, been using Photoshop, I think there's a reason it calls users, since uh, 1991, and uh, it's changed the way that I see the world. So it's been a fascinating journey of discovery, and it continues every day. And where can we find you online, John Paul? Uh, if you can spell my name, johnpaulcapanegro.com. All right, well, we'll spell it later in the broadcast. <laughs> and then, who is that little nice woman down there? Big nice woman. Which right one? Right next to John Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Am I the big woman? <laughs> <laughs> big in uh, fame and stature, not in... Yeah. Hi, I'm Karen Hutton. <laughs> and uh, let's see, I'm a photographer and a voiceover artist. I do the voice for Trey Ratcliffe's Stuck on Earth app. I'm the voice of the guard. Um, as well as Motion X GPS Drive for the iPhone and iPad. And um, my voiceover world, you can find me there at KarenHutton.com. My photography worlds are both at KarenHuttonPhotography.com and G+, of course. Happy to be here. <laughs> Go ahead, Keith. Hi, I'm Keith Barrett of uh, Google Plus Hangout Addiction fame, and I'm on VidcastNetwork.com and KeithBarrett.com. And then... It's, if it's in the order, it's me next. Hi, I'm Ron Clifford. Uh, I'm a photographer, an artist, and a community builder. Uh, I spend uh, a little bit more time than I should here on Google+, Plus, but I love it. I, I love uh, the people that I've met here and the relationships that I've built. You can find uh, most of my current work in my stream right here on Google+, Plus or on ronclifford.com. Hi, I'm Sandra Parlow, and um, I am mostly just a Googler, and <laughs> I'm a photographer as well. Um, I don't have a website, uh, but most of my work is on Google, and uh, I just really enjoy uh, the learning that goes on and the community here, and I'm really happy to be here tonight to listen to what John Paul has to say. Viv? Um, my name is Vivian Gutswa. Um, my main website is New York Through the Lens, which is nythroughthelens.com. But you can pretty much find me on Google Plus since I post everything there that I post on my website anyway. And I'm happy to be here tonight. Terrific. Ron, did we skip you? No, no? you didn't skip me. Oh, you went? I was doing something else. That's okay. <laughs> I know who you are. Um, <laughs> yeah, there is a likelihood because of where John Paul is, he'll pop in and out. So, Keith, when that happens, are you able to send an invite? Because I'm not able to do that from here. Well, if I, if I send him an invite, it'll interrupt the broadcast every time I do it. Oh. Well, I hope you can find his old one then. It should still be there. Yeah. Well, maybe, Ron, you can send him a message or something and tell him what to do. Yeah, I'll just send him that right now. I'm going okay. to mute. Excuse me. 
Yeah, if he well, does speak up and say, and say he needs it, let me know and I'll... Um, you guys, you can chat yourself. You can write yourself little chat messages over there and tell it what to do, right? I can't participate in that chat now. Oh, my. I'm in the other one now, the Vidcast Network chat. Well, that reminds me that everybody who's out there watching, there is a chat on vidcastnetwork.com. That's V-I-D-C-A-S-T network.com. And that's Keith Barrett's broadcasting network. So if you go over there, if you happen to be watching on G+, you'll be able to participate in that chat and ask us questions and hopefully ask John Paul questions if we can get him back in. In the meantime... I want to turn to Lightroom and share my screen with you and show you some of the new features in this program that just came out today. So I'm going to go ahead and try that. Did any of you guys use Lightroom in the panel? I mostly use oh. Lightroom to help organize my photos and, and uh, you know, do, help me with the download and stuff like that. I don't actually process in Lightroom very much. I oh, use yeah. Sorry. I use Lightroom, um, but I I kind of use it as a jumping off point for color effects, <laughs> which is my main software of choice now. Um, but I find myself using it a lot more now um, in terms of what I'm doing with my photos in terms of processing. So. Cool. Well, you know, I also resisted using it for a long time because I just am in love with Photoshop, and that's what I'd used for so long. But I am a convert, and, um, you know, I, I kind of had to learn it because I do these courses on the um, video training site called lynda.com, and they asked me to do Lightroom courses, so I started spending more time there, and I'm now addicted. It really has a lot to offer. So I thought that before I start showing you things about Lightroom, I think there are probably people out there who don't know what Lightroom is. Maybe they know something about it, but they don't really get it. So in a nutshell, um, if I had to summarize it, I would say it's like three programs in one. It is a program in which you can process, or you might say edit, or correct images. That's true. And it has really powerful, intuitive controls for doing that that let you get a lot done in a very short time without a steep learning curve. And so that, I think, is the real, um, I don't know, the real pull of the processing part of Lightroom. But it also has, it's like two other programs rolled in with the processor. And one of those is a digital, the fancy word is digital asset management program, which basically means a big organizer, a place where you can bring in all your photos, no matter where you keep them, on your computer or on external drives, um, or even, God forbid, on DVDs or wherever, um, and have them kept track of in a database. And, you know, it really, as we start shooting more and more digital photos, you got to do something. I mean, you can't just rely on your folder system because after a while, you're not going to be able to find the photos that you want. It just doesn't work. It's inherently a flawed system to just use folders. So we have the processor. We have the digital asset management organizer part. And then we have all these really cool places and ways that you can share your photos when you're done organizing them and, uh, and getting them all, <clears throat> all processed. And you can look up here at the top of Lightroom, and you can see the various modules um, that allow you to present and share your photos. There's a brand new map module that allows you to locate your photos um, on a map by location and kind of keep track of them that way. The big hot ticket item, or one of those, is the new book module in Lightroom 4 that just came out today. And that book module is a place where you can generate really great looking photo books to show off your books. And these books can be sent directly from Lightroom to Blurb. Anybody familiar with Blurb? Blurb is one of those on, or what do they call it, on-demand printing uh, outfits that makes really high-end books and is great for making hardcover as, as well as softcover photo books, complete with nice paper, uh, those kind of flaps that go around if you want them, and everything. I mean, they, you know, it looks as good as having it published in the traditional way. You can make slideshows, prints, and you can pair things for web, other ways to output from Lightroom. So those are like the three buckets. You've got your library for organizing, your develop area or module for processing your photos, and all these other things for outputting photos. Make sense? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Okay, but let me ask you, did, did any of you ever go anywhere except for the develop module in Lightroom? No. I'm going to be honest, I only ever use the develop module. 
<laughs> that's what I figured, you know. But that's 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 yeah. okay. You know, uh, you can you should use it however you like. But I do did want you to know about it. Okay, so having said that, I'm going to take another few minutes um, to show you what I think is the reason to upgrade to Lightroom 4, the version of Lightroom that came out today. Now there are many reasons, but you know everybody's got the one that appeals to them. And I think as photographers, it's the the ability to get the best process print out of Lightroom that's the most attractive. And with Lightroom 4, Adobe has changed the way that um, the controls in the develop module work. So that you're able to get um, highlights with more detail as well as shadows with detail and get really crisp uh, midtones from the new slider system in Lightroom 4. So that to me is what's really hot about it. Make sense? All right, let me show you what that looks like. So Sorry, I Jay, happen to be... I was just going to say, um, one of the reasons when you ask a question, if we don't all jump in, is because we're rushing to unmute ourselves. <laughs> so, yes, it makes sense. <laughs> oh, good, I'm glad. <laughs> okay, I just want to let you know we're not ignoring <laughs> you. We're still here. Anything I thought you might caught it catatonic on me. All right, look, can you all see my screen and you see all of Lightroom there? Yes. Yes. So in the middle is a photo that I happen to have open. Um, I have it open in the develop module, the place where you can process photos. This is a raw photo that I shot in Monterosso, Italy. Not so far from where John Paul is right now. And it was a crazy day there. The wind and the water were just, I mean, you can see what was happening. Um, this is the same place where they had terrible floods recently. And, um, you know, these wonderful towns were basically just, it was, it was like, unbelievable what happened to them. But this day, nothing really terrible happened, and the kids were having fun playing with the water. And so this is what came out of my digital camera as a RAW file. Now, uh, you, you know probably that you can't judge a RAW file by the way it first looks, because a RAW file is just raw data, and you know comes into Lightroom or some other program, and those programs have to display it in some way. So this is just kind of the first crack at it, the default that comes out of the camera. So what I wanted to show you quickly is how, how easy it is to go through um, the sliders in what's called the basic panel in Lightroom to quickly change this photo into this photo. Can you see a difference there? Oh, yes. Yeah, the rocks are really, really beautiful. So I started back here with this photo, kind of dull. Not very much saturation, uh, not a lot of detail in these waves here, and everything's just kind of gray. If you look down here, there's a little tiny icon, and this icon means that this is a photo that I had already played with back in Lightroom 3 using uh, a different process for developing photos. And when you have a photo like that and you're using it with Lightroom 4 now, you are going to have to upgrade it. And the way to do that is just click that little icon. So that's thing number one that I'm going to do is click that little icon, and I'll say update. And now it is in the system um, that can use the controls in Lightroom 4, which is called Process Version 2012 is the fancy name. Anyway, now that I've done that, my sliders over here changed. And I have the Lightroom 4 series of sliders rather than the Lightroom 3 series. So the way these sliders work and why they're so great is you can just go to this panel that says basic and you can start going through the sliders from top to bottom. And that is the recommended workflow. Now you don't have to do it that way, but if you don't, you know, it's kind of you're just going to be dragging sliders around willy-nilly. If you do start at the top and go down, everything kind of works in a logical way. So the first sliders here are the white balance sliders, the ones that allow you to correct any color cast in the image. So I don't think this, uh, this image has too much of a color cast. I might want to warm it up a little bit. And I would just go to the temperature slider here and drag it from the blue side over to the gold side. And that's a good example of how intuitive the sliders are in Lightroom. I mean, you can just see what it does right on it. You don't have to have you know, special instruction. So I might pull that one over just a bit. And then um, I'm going to come down to the next sliders, which are the ones that adjust tone. And the first of those is called the exposure slider. Now, this is going to be a bit confusing if anybody has already been using Lightroom 3, because Lightroom 3 had an exposure slider, but it worked differently than this one. So here's the deal on the Lightroom 4 exposure slider. This adjusts brightness. 
overall general brightness. So what you want to do with this slider is start at its midpoint, which is zero, and if you want your image to be overall brighter, especially kind of in the mid-tone areas, like in, this, um, in these gray terraces and rocks here, you pull the exposure slider over toward the right. So I'm going to do that. Of course, if you want it to be darker, you pull it to the left. Did you see it get brighter? Yes. Oh. Okay, so that's thing number one that you do. Now, you do not worry yourself about the very white points of the waves where I just lost a bunch of detail, you know, or other blown out highlights at this point. You just look at the midtones, and that's the best way to start off using the exposure slider because we'll use other sliders to fix the blown out highlights. Then the next thing is come to the contrast slider, and most of you probably know that contrast means the amount of difference between the dark and light tones in an image, and most images look best if they have a little bit more contrast, especially if you're used to seeing HDR and all that fancy stuff. So I'm going to drag the contrast slider slightly over to the right in this case. I try not to go too far because I like a more natural look. And then we come down to new sliders in Lightroom 4. So if you're used to using Lightroom 3, you have to change, you have to think a different way. What these are are four sliders, the highlights and shadows sliders and the whites and black sliders. The highlights and shadows sliders control or govern the highlights that are not the really far ones over at the ends here and here, but the next group of sliders. If I move my mouse over the histogram, which represents the tones in this image, you can see those areas laid up. Here's the area that is the, um, you know, the, the shadow areas, the dark areas of this photo, and here is the part that's the light areas. And the best thing, usually, is to keep detail in those hat, <coughs> excuse me, highlights and shadows. So here's what you can do with these sliders. I'm going to take that highlight slider, and I'm going to drag that all the way over to the left. And as I do, look at the waves. I'm bringing back detail in the bright part of the waves. Let me do that again. I'm going to double click the highlights label to send that slider back to the middle and then I'm going to zoom in and maybe you'll be able to see that better if I zoom in. I might uh, interject here, of all the features that I found in Lightroom 4, that feature is the most improved. It is really phenomenal. It used to be what they call the recovery slider and I probably 8 out of 10 times it really didn't work very well. Um, yeah. Whereas in the new Lightroom, uh, it not only works at, like the recovery slider, Lighter, but it goes in both centered and it works in both directions. And You're it really, absolutely right, Ron. Um, You're right. It does work better. Part of the image. That's right. So watch again now that I've did anyway, I zoom I in or I zoomed out? out. Zoom back out. No, no you're right. You're I agree now. with you. Okay, here. So now you can really get close. I hope you'll be able to see when I drag that um, highlight slider over to the left, how much more detail there is in that water you can see all the kind of gray tones as it breaks up above these kids' head. And, you know, of course it's hard to see here because we're all online, but it really makes a difference. So that's a big thing right there, is the highlight slider that brings detail back into the highlights, and it basically backs off of highlights that are clipped or blown out because they're too bright. And then the opposite is true for the shadow slider. Keep your eye over here where we have really dark areas in the cave, for example. As I drag the shadow slider way over to the right, and that's opening up the shadow areas so that you can see detail in there in the rocks that we couldn't see a moment ago. So again, if I have the shadow slider where it was, everything is kind of dark over here. And if I pull it over to the right, everything brightens up in the shadow areas. And in some photos, you really can save photos that you might have thrown away because you thought they were too dark in the darkest areas. Finally. Yeah, can. Sorry, can I just interject? There was a question, um, and I hope you can answer uh, from Dave in the, there. He wants to know if you can still use the J key to show blown out areas. You know, I have to tell you that I don't know, and here is why. I hardly ever use shortcuts because I'm always teaching, and when you teach, it's, uh, it's a mess to use shortcuts because nobody knows what you're doing, um, and so I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> but well, you can find out, I'm sure, by looking in the help file, so and the help file is already online. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, all right, so, so let me uh, continue because I don't want to spend the whole night doing this. I want to get to John Paul. There are only a few more sliders here. The whites and black sliders are 
the ones that set the farthest ends of the histogram. So if I wanted the white parts of the waves to be close to pure white, I would drag the white slider over to the right. But you know, it's not that necessary anymore, like it was in Lightroom 3. You used to control the bright ends of the spectrum with the exposure slider. Not true anymore. Exposure slider is only for the midtones now. That's what you should be concentrating on. It's the white slider that deals with this area of the histogram on the far right. And in this case, I think that the whites are white enough, so I'm just going to leave that. But watch what the blacks does. This controls the far left of the histogram. And when you add more black to an image, you often make the image look more contrasty. And you make the dark areas just you know, get this kind of rich black to them that really makes an image pop more. So, so far, that's where we are. I'm going to um, press the backslash key on my keyboard to remind you of where I started and where I am now. Started, am now. And finally, I'll come down to the clarity slider, which um, sharpens and it, it makes the midtones in the image look sharper and more detailed. And the clarity slider has been worked on in Lightroom 4 also, and it really works much better now. In the past, sometimes you would get kind of halos around edges with clarity slider, and now it just makes the midtones pop and gives all that nice detail in the rocks, for example, in this image. And finally, we have the old vibrance slider. That has not changed. That's a way of bringing saturation or intensity to color without overdoing it. So let me just show you. If instead of vibrance, I pulled the saturation slider over, look what happens. <laughs> Everybody gets a big sunburn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but vibrance does that, um, watching out for skin tones in particular and not overdoing them. So that is how you use the basic correction tools in the new basics panel in the develop module. And again, that can take an image from something like this that is OK but kind of dull and dark to something like this that's bright, basically starting at the top and just dragging the sliders, but thinking about the principles that I told you. Exposure for uh, brightening or darkening midtones, contrast for expanding the tonal range, highlights and shadows for dealing with those three-quarter tone highlights and three-quarter tone shadows where you want detail but you do want them a little darker or brighter to expand contrast. And then whites and blacks, white's not so important anymore. Blacks, darken them down for a more pop. And clarity for improving midtone contrast. Vibrance for getting some more intensity to color without overdoing it. So that's what I wanted to tell you. It's different. Have fun with it. Jen, um, did they completely get rid of fill white? I'm assuming they just kind of replaced fill light with highlight shadows and whites and blacks. Exactly. The closest thing to fill light is the shadow sliders. Remember that here, the dark areas are, are booked up. You, know, they're, they're, you don't see detail there. So like the fill slider, if you drag the shadow slider now, that will open up the, the darker areas. And that's what the fill slider used to do. Huh. So you no longer have recovery slider. One of the biggest slider. differences is that they're more specific. Go ahead, Jen. Yeah, that's right, Ron. Ron is right. So these sliders are more specific. Each one adjusts just part of that histogram, whereas in the past, there was all this overlap some, if you went too far with some of these sliders. So if you dragged both the fill and recovery sliders, sometimes they would bump into one another, and you'd end up with this kind of gray, cloudy-looking thing over the whole image. And now you don't have that. I've got my highlights all the way to the left and my shadows all the way to the right, and everything looks fine in, that, in terms of that. Make sense? Yeah, and that, Jen, in addition, it really right. renders detail uh, a lot more. Um, when, if you're used to exposing to the right, uh, if there's any chance of posterization, uh, you'll end up with a lot less of it in Lightroom 3. I'm really astonished by highlights that I can recover. Yes, you're right. That's why I'm zooming in to show some detail here. It really does a great job of that. And one of the reasons is the clarity slider has been improved for the midtone contrast. The other reason is that the highlight slider, or, or excuse me, that the whole um, algorithm here stops the highlights from being completely blown out. So you very seldom see a spike on the right side of the histogram. For those who know, that would represent clipped or blown out highlights. OK, so with that, I'm going to try to turn this screen back over to our special guest, John Paul, so that we can hear what he has to tell us. Just give me a second there. 
Okay. So, John Paul, do you want to try clicking on the screen share? Do you have a screen, something you want to share with us? Pray with me. <laughs> <laughs> I should choose the desktop, not the Google Plus Hangouts, right? That's right. How's it looking? Not yet. Yeah, that's there. there. So do you it's see uh, do you see Here the purple is. image now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for being patient with me on uh, this first Google Hangout. <laughs> You're doing great. Jan wanted to uh, talk a little bit about color. One of the things I'm most passionate about is something we all deal with, even if we're black and white photographers. I've long felt that uh, black and white are simply two colors in a larger spectrum, and they treat them as colors. A lot of um, thoughts and ideas about color open up. Uh, one of the things that I want to highlight is that in this day and age, we have such a, an extraordinary degree of control over color. A lot of times we don't explore our options as much as we could. Uh, Comparing relative saturation, comparing full saturation with uh, neutral color, uh, adding a synthetic or uh, ambient effect, either warming it up or cooling it, or even creating synthetic color. Clearly, this is not the color of the original sky, nor many skies that any of us have seen. Uh, but why, why should not be on the table as well? I remember it's true that my uh, father used to tell a lot. He said, uh, I knew you'd be okay, kid, one day when uh, you came home with two drawings. One was a picture of uh, green grass and blue sky. And he said, look what the teacher made me do. And then you slap down the next picture, purple sky, brown grass. He said, you know, I knew in that moment you'd be okay. So there are a lot of different types of color that we can trade in, and this... Uh, almost embarrassment of riches, I think, uh, begs that we think about color a little more precisely, explore our options a little bit more. Uh, even for the black and white photographer, you're stripping out two variables, hue and saturation, I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, to be able to reverse a figure ground relationship like this, simply through a di different color conversion, to be able to uh, tone images, whether warm or cold, or even cross tone, in very complex and subtle ways, it just opens up a huge range of expression. And uh, my feeling is that uh, thinking about color in uh, specific ways helps open up new doors and also helps manage all of that uh, new opportunity because we have so many more choices. It's uh, challenging to know where to go. I think it's, uh, it, it would be well worth everybody's while to spend a little bit of time to decide where exactly they want to go before they start off. Uh, one thing that is really important to understand is that uh, color is an event, that color happens inside us, and we can really verify that uh, the actual color is out there because uh, it's a physiological and even psychological response. And our response to uh, color is um, really just to a small slice of the electromagnetic spectrum. There's a whole lot that we don't turn into color. Um, you know what, John Paul, it's really hard for us to hear you. It's it sounds very gurgled. Okay. Let me see if I lean into the computer. Uh, any better on this one? No, it's probably no. either internet or do you have multiple programs running on your computer? I have Bridge Lightroom Photoshop. You Maybe you can close one of those. I would Photoshop close that dialog. If you have another tab open that maybe has Google running or something else, I'd close other tabs on your browser, too. Sure. But we don't want to read your email. <laughs> <laughs> well, one more program to close, right? Just don't close the Hangout. Right, right now, you're talking about it's going to fade in and out because of your connection, but we're getting a good screen share. So. Well, you know, while John Paul is letting us read his email, you really are, John Paul. You want to Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I want to tell you something about him while he's uh, sort of fixing his setup there. 
Um, I neglected to say that John Paul is a really well-known fine art photographer, and um, he's an expert in digital media. He is uh, an authority on creativity, an authority on fine art digital printing. He goes around and advises clients from Apple to, um, to Adobe and others. And he teaches workshops around the world, really interesting photo workshops. And I hope he'll have time to tell us about some of those that are coming up. I know he spent a lot of time in Iceland at workshops. And he's also a writer. He's written a really important Photoshop book, Adobe Masterclass. He writes for Photoshop User Magazine, for Huffington Post, and other places. So he really is you know, somebody who's done it all. And he understands this stuff on a level um, that, to be honest, I really don't. You know, I'm a technologist. He is a creative thinker, and I'm really excited to, I hope we can hear what he has to say from Italy. <laughs> that's, that's okay. <laughs> Thanks for covering me when I close with you. Thanks, there. It's great. Thank you. Um, is this any better, or is my love voice at uh, 3.30 in the morning in Italy just not carrying through? It's not eh. It is a little yeah. better. It's not uh, I, I would just recommend speak slower and clearer, and maybe it'll help. Yeah. Okay. Enunciate. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we'll try this a little slower, and I'll try to be really clear. Um, with that in mind, I was speaking about how color is an event, and how we only see a small amount of the electromagnetic spectrum. And it's important to understand that color is something that we all do. And I think once you acknowledge that, you get a lot more freedom and leeway about what you can do with color. Uh, it's just a tool for communication, like vocabulary. Uh, you think of that as, as kind of a visual language. Uh, rather than managing 60 million colors we can see, uh, I think it's really useful to think in three broad terms, uh, breaking it down into its three essential components. So really only are three. Luminosity, hue, and maturation, different qualities of color. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those. And the vocabulary. I think visual artists are often challenged to come up with the words to help clearly describe uh, each of these components. And uh, that's particularly true in uh, painting and photography, where there are a lot of different terms that are used interchangeably. You want to make an image brighter. Well, if you do that by increasing saturation or lights, or is it because you're using a hue like yellow, which tends to look lighter than blue? There's a number of these confusing terms, and I quickly defaulted to the terms that are inside the Photoshop interface and even our blend modes in there, luminosity, hue, and saturation, even though they're not ideal. Painters might take issue with the idea that a more intense color is a more saturated color, because they often talk about putting paint on canvas, and a canvas that is soaked with more paint would more saturated. Sometimes they use the word the intensity instead. But let's just have on that luminosity, Q, and saturation, which is also built into not only the Photoshop interface, but also the Lightroom interface. And I'm delighted that they use that language. And I think some of the conversations I had early on with the engineers might have helped a little bit. They'd already been thinking about that, so I hope they, they continue to emphasize that. So, luminosity, how light or dark is a color, whether it's zone 0 or zone 5, that midtone gray, 18% reflectance, or the highlights that we've been talking about. Ansel Adams' zone system was more than just a technical way of controlling both shadows and highlights. It was also a language. He created a scale of 1 to 10, or at least used a scale of 1 to 10. Oh, he's Whoops. <laughs> I think that was coming. <laughs> Hey, hey, hey. All right, well, maybe when he comes back in, we'll be able to hear him better. I hope so. I apologize to everyone out there. Now, Jan, did you have, um, did you have that, that um, demo on the sharpening ready for if this wasn't going to work out very well? Yeah, I do. I do. I have some other things that I can talk to you about. So let's just give him a second, see if he comes back in. And if he doesn't, then we'll go ahead. So what was and I'm sure if, if things don't work out, I'm sure he'd be happy to come back when he's, he's back on, on uh, stable ground. <laughs> so, Jan, when he was talking, what was he talking about with the, um, did you understand 
like what he was talking about was new to me and I couldn't understand what, it, what he was saying, but I could see it. So I know it had to do with light and luminosity and color. Right. I think what he was saying, and I do not want to put words in his no, no. mouth, is that um, this would be my take on it, which is, you know, color is something that happens inside of us. There's no thing out there that is color that floats around in the air. Um, color is just uh, some kind of uh, impulses, and I'm not a scientist, so I don't know what, but the color occurs when we interpret uh, that input, you know, that light coming off of objects. And so then mm -hmm. the so what he was, I think, talking about is um, how you interpret that and what, what principles you use to interpret that. Interesting. Hi, Jim Paul. Hey, I'm back. You uh, know, I have an idea. Maybe don't share your screen for a minute, and you could summarize what you just said. Um, Karen sure. was saying that she couldn't really hear. Well, I saw the pictures, and I could hear some of what you were saying, but it was it was new. Your approach was new, although I did read your color theory, you know, the, the piece you wrote on color theory, which is fantastic. So was it about that? Yeah, it is a lot about that. Um, it's about one of the core concepts that I think about uh, in addressing color, and it'll help a lot of people uh, identify what tool to use in Photoshop or Lightroom and how to use it, as well as... Uh, give them a lot of ideas for how to structure color relationships within their image to make them more effective and how they might structure their own color palette that might create a unique style. Right? Color is really important in that respect. Uh, you know, if I say the word Ansel Adams, nobody's really thinking super saturated color. And uh, uh, Monet, nobody's really thinking neutral. You know, with one word, the name, you can associate a color palette with that one. That doesn't mean that an artist can't trade in a wide and very palette, but uh, it does help to create a kind of a color code and how you relate those three elements, luminosity, how light or dark the uh, color is, hue, which here we can think of hue as, as color, but really color would be all three components together, and saturation, how intense the color is. And uh, I often recommend that people adjust the uh, color in their images in that order. Uh, I know that uh, in Lightroom you've got the white point sliders up at the top, and uh, it's often recommended to just start there. I, I don't know why Thomas built that way. Uh, I prefer to start with the tonal foundation, the light and dark. So I'd be moving straight to the uh, exposure and all those great sliders Jan was showing you on the highlights and shadows before moving into the hue, and then finally moving into uh, saturation and vibrance. Uh, I'll give you an example of why uh, a yellow is most saturated when it's light, a blue is most saturated when it's dark, and if you change the value or the light and dark, uh, the saturation is going to move with it. So I think it often helps to uh, work in a, in, in a slightly different or in a more structured way that way. So there's a lot of ways that you can talk about color and those three elements that are really useful. Um, I could give you a few visual examples. Certainly I could uh, post some up on my website. There are some on my TV about uh, how uh, artists in creating a signature style, very often the, the most effective strategy that I've seen is to prioritize one of those elements of color. I uh, use a high degree of contrast in that element. Uh, black and white photographers tend to emphasize the light and dark contrast. They might tint their images subtly. Uh, black and white, the purely neutral, might be an exception to this, uh, in that it's uh, dealing with contrast only on the light and dark. Um, but if you get into the larger color fields, imagine, uh, well, let me give you the code. Uh, if, if you use a high degree of contrast in one element, a medium degree of contrast in the other, uh, a second, and a low degree of contrast in third, essentially you're, you're prioritizing one element of color over another and driving attention to those qualities, those characteristics. Color is uh, both psychological, it describes space, it has an emotional component to it. There's a whole field of color psychology, which is fascinating. I think there's a, there's a great author, uh, a guy named Faber Biren, who's written like 75 books on color. I don't recommend you read all 75, uh, but there, there is one compendium called Color, <laughs> and it's a huge survey. It looks at things from the point of our history. It looks at things 
uh, add color from perspective of color psychology and even how they use it in medicine and design. Uh, so it's, it's a really rich field. Uh, back to that, that color code, high, medium, low. If you've got three elements of color, uh, if you used a high degree, medium degree, low degree in each one of those values, you tend to have a stronger, more prioritized color structure. I'll give an example, Rembrandt. High degree of contrast in light and dark. It's got a lot of chiaroscuro, the uh, inky dark shadows, and got these pools of highlights that yeah. really target the eye. It, it's a medium degree of saturation. Some of the highlights and shadows are neutral. Uh, some of them have a fair amount of saturation into them. The mid tones certainly do. And it, it's a low degree of contrast in hue. It's uh, mostly earth tones, yellows, browns, oranges. It has a more unified palette. If you look at a lot of the Impressionists, like Monet, um, you'll see a high degree of contrasting. you look at Monet's shadows and see that there are oranges or blues in them. Uh, you'll also find that in most of those Impressionist palettes, they pull their punch on the light and dark aspect of things so that the color seems more unified, more modulated. It uh, really speaks more to time of day and atmosphere than it does the physicality of the things in the three-dimensional form of those haystacks or uh, churches that he might be painting. So which aspect of color do you emphasize often directs attention to different qualities, different emotional responses, and different ways of treating space, which I think is one of the most important things in, uh, in representational images. Yeah. For making uh, photographs, kind of the height of representation. We have all these tools, and color is one of them, to help us uh, create this illusion of uh, a real world inside either that window or mirror of the photograph that we make. There are exceptions, and uh, I, I think one of the things to think about is that there are many different types of color con. Uh oh. Ah. Oh. This is so interesting. It I is. Know. It's amazing. As photographers, I'll just chime in for a second. As photographers, we don't spend as much time understanding. Hi, hi. There he is. Oops. Sorry, you froze there for a sec, John. <laughs> okay. I'm waving my there? hands too much. The audio is coming across much better now, though, except for a little occasional. If you can just pretend you're in a straitjacket, you'll probably. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know the old joke, how, how do you silence an Italian and get them to sit on their hands or something like that, <laughs> tie their hands down. Oh, <laughs> well, we we're going to get, get email from Italians now. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. You know, he's allowed email. to say he's Italian. So. <laughs> exactly, right. <laughs> right. Um, so what I was saying is that high, high palette is really hard to handle, and a lot of people go to it very quickly because contrast builds energy. Let's get more light and contrast. Let's get more hue contrast. Let's get more saturation contrast. And very often that makes images that are loud, uh, chaotic, kind of broken. It's not that it can't work. Uh, in some cases, uh, it works very well. Think, think of Andy Warhol and how... I got a question. Is Andy Warhol really a painter or is he a photographer? D don't answer that. Um, but, <laughs> Good question. Um, well, we could talk about uh, David LaChapelle, who is one of the few photographers I've seen who uses a high, high, high palette uh, for a really effective reason. A lot of his images are uh, satirical in nature. And they've often got that overly dramatic, somewhat cartoon-like quality to it. Uh, you know, they're fabulously, fabulously orchestrated as well. And that kind of in-your-face palette really works well for him. Um, I can't imagine Yosemite, though, in uh, a high, high, high palette like that. No. Oh, I know some people who can. <laughs> <laughs> some yeah. people right here have been to Yosemite. And, and are you talking about HDR as this sort of high contrast, um, potentially broken way of using color? No. Actually, I'm just talking about using a high degree of light and dark contrast, a high degree of hue contrast. You've got the full, degree, the full rainbow and a uh, high degree of, uh, of contrast and saturation, both neutrals and super saturated colors. So that's, that's what I'm talking about there. Um, yeah, I know all the language is challenging. High dynamic range, high contrast. You know, a, a lot of people think of contrast as just having a lot of highlights and shadows, where uh, I think it's useful to think of contrast as also uh, including hue 
and saturation. And uh, where you put the contrast is where the eye goes to. So if you put a lot of contrast everywhere in a lot of different variables, the eye is going everywhere. And I think it's useful to think about creating more unified color relationships. Um, it, they often talk about color harmony, challenging, uh, because different people prefer different color combinations. And uh, sometimes you want a, 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 a challenging color relationship for a challenging message. But uh, I think having a consistent color structure helps a great deal. And, uh, you know, the risk of uh, freezing the screen, I could show you three different bodies of work of mine very quickly that uh, use different color codes mm, as a way of suggesting that artists can be varied in their approach. It's just in a single body of work, I think one wants to have a, a certain color code for it. And it's one of the first things I try to figure out when I'm working on a, on a new series of images. Um, you know, I, would love, I would love to see that, and I'm thinking maybe the way we could do it is if you could tell us what we're going to see before you put them up there. And then yeah, keep the talking down. <laughs> That's an excellent idea. <laughs> okay. So, uh, okay, uh, so just that uh, while you're oh, – sorry, I was just going to say just before you do that. <laughs> it's hard to talk. I'm not – uh, I've got it. Just before you do that, I was going to say um, you were talking about doing a, a series. As photographers, um, we often grapple with ideas like signature and style. And you're kind of saying you're not you're not trapped into a specific signature or style, but you do do series which will contain similar elements, uh, cohesiveness, and then break off into a new series again later. Like when you look at your body of work, you can see a lot of change. Well, each series seems to have a, a very cohesive theme. Am I yeah, understanding that? That's exactly what I'm saying. Absolutely. Um, you could also say that the uh, the wider the range of color that an artist treats, uh, the more the work starts to become about color. Uh, so you, you want to manage any kind of uh, variety within your work uh, well, because it uh, will drive attention to that variety. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Like I say, as artists, a painter, I started out as a painter, we think about that all the time. But as photographers, we don't understand how much control we really have over the color palette. Often we think we have what we've captured, and that's what we have to deal with. Whereas yeah. with tools like Photoshop, um, a whole new world is opened up where we're able to manipulate that. That's exactly right. Uh, I remember being a kid when my dad was teaching at the Ansel Adams Photography Workshop, and there was... Uh, some conversation that came up about uh, the difference between black and white and color photography and how color photography hadn't arrived because people didn't have as much control over uh, color as they did over black and white uh, images. And uh, I think one of the directors then uh, quite presciently said he thought that that would change and Ansel looked towards digital technology to uh, bring about part of that change. And so it's opened up a whole new window. Part of it has been a technological limitation. Uh, part of it's also just a mentality as well, though. When you make photographs in a 25th of a second, things are so fully formed that you often don't think about how much you can process them, how many different ways you uh, treat them, and how many different areas you can take them to. And it requires a little bit of forethought. It's a different kind of pre-visualization. So it can be useful. Yeah. Janice, shall I try and show you three different bodies of work very quickly? I won't show you the whole thing, but I'll show you a, a couple of sets. And, and at least we'll see the color code. And there's a couple of outliers in there that I'll identify as well. Cross my fingers. And uh, share my screen again. Yeah, yeah try it. Close Lightroom, so it'll it'll take just like, oh no, okay. No, you're good. Uh, what it wants me to do is set my clock back, and that may bump the server really quick. Uh, let's not do that. Let's. You want to minimize that window that says Google Plus and shows me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See if I come at it from a different direction. I know iPhone doesn't have its little. Uh, 
date issue here. Can you see that screen now? Yes. Number of images. And we can hear you. <laughs> it was Karen. <laughs> Where's Karen? I don't know. I, I don't see so many people. <laughs> so I was going to say there's an interesting discussion just before you go. The discussion is, is going kind of like, how do we know that we're all seeing the same color the same way? And I think the answer is we really don't. <laughs> but it's interesting to say that because we all understand what our perception of blue or red is, we assume that everyone sees it the same way. That's exactly right. Um, it's a philosophical discussion at that point because we haven't found a way to verify that scientifically. That's right. We have such an intelligent chat room. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 there, there are frequencies associated with each color and certain abilities of various, you know, nerves and neurons to be able to pick up certain frequencies. So you can roughly get there. in the ballpark, but you don't know what the precision is. Yeah, absolutely. And thank God we have something called consensus. We can all agree that um, you know the same frequencies produce a similar response, or at least something that we can agree upon, so we can communicate. Um, and I, I think really. We probably do have a much more similar response to these specific frequencies like red uh, than uh, you know, some of the, the, uh, the philosophical discussions about how we're phenomenologically we can't really verify that our experiences are identical or, or, or much less even similar. But uh, the fact that we do have consensus, we all agree that we're looking at something called red uh, and we have a linguistic uh, term to help us describe that, and in some ways we're moving more towards numerical terms. I prefer to think in terms of numerical terms, that this is a, uh, well, this is a 5 or a 10 degree red, you know, but that's, that's, a, that's for a different discussion. It's actually more precise and it's a lot easier to memorize than, uh, say, the Pantone color checker. Once you have a more refined language for color, though, uh, you, you can communicate with more sophistication and subtlety. Uh, in this series of images that I've got up here on screen, I think you can see that it's a, it's a fairly low level of saturation with a few outliers and uh, highlight those. Uh, I, I pull those out and I might think about this. Uh, if I just looked at images like this and this and we're this. Not, we're we're, we're just seeing the, the change in images. We still see just the gallery. There view. we go. Yeah. I, th I think your computer is struggling between oh, there we go. We have a your, your desktop and your voice. Yeah, I see, yeah. Yeah, I see that the image change now. Yeah. Probably so if I go a little slower. We see a statue that's kind of um, subtle in color. Right. So I call this a semi-neutral palette, and that's what I'd be working with then. And I decided just how wide that envelope is. I could go uh, cooler and more neutral. I could go warmer. But I think once I get into something like this, I've broken the color code. This one's not like the others. Kind of like Sesame Street. One of these things is not like the others. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it, creates, it creates tension within the work. And I either need to build bridges by increasing saturation slowly between other pieces or need to present this separately as, as a difference. Uh, by work, because I think it's going to be very challenging for me to reconcile these two very different color codes. Uh, I could ramp up the saturation on this one, or I could lower the saturation on this one. There's a lot of play as to how I could uh, get these two to come together. Check the other quick body work. Are these is that are these manufactured <laughs> images in some way, John Paul, or are these straight shots? Uh, everything that I've seen so far has been composited in Photoshop. So usually they involve more than one source. Um, there's usually about 20% of my work in body of work that uh, is fairly straight up, depending on the body of work. Uh, but you would never know it, because in context, everybody assumes that what I do has been altered, which, which is fine. That's kind of the effect that I'm going for. Yeah, that's an interesting point to bring up, John Paul, because I know as photographers, there there's almost, I mean, there's there's a camp that doesn't doesn't really care, but there's almost two polarities where some are very purist and they feel that too much manipulation is not true to the art form, and others, uh, yourself and I would be included in that, would say that this is an art form, and manipulation is certainly welcome to um, express an idea, a thought, an emotion. Um, but to use it as an expressive art form and uh, 
personally myself, this year has been a real breakthrough in that I'm allowing myself and giving myself permission to take my images to another level, and Photoshop has a lot to do with that. Yeah, I think the um, question is not, is it okay, but what happens when? When you change things, people relate to the images that you create differently, and that's appropriate. Uh, but it's not appropriate for somebody else to say this incredibly versatile, fast-evolving tool called photography is only capable of one thing. There is only one true religion for photography. <laughs> and if you want to use it, you should use it the way that I use it or that our predecessors have used it. Part of the reason we have photography is that people experiment and try new things. So I think that uh, one should give oneself permission to go wherever one wants to go. But then after one time, where one wants to go, be a little bit considered about uh, what's actually happened and how things have changed. Uh, but this idea that there's only one drives me crazy. Yeah. Human spirit is much greater than photography. So put photography in the service of something. Uh, so some of the images I showed you, it's kind of blue. You can see there are, there are warm blues and there are uh, cool blues, but it, it really is yeah. kind of a, a meditation on blue. Now, I throw in bright colors in a sense, and I think there is one in this sense. I got an outlier here. This, this is going to kind of break the cut and draw attention away. And in fact, when you put a strong field of color like this in the presence of all of those other blues, um, the subtle differences between the blues is lost or it is not as uh, easily uh, seen. The interesting when you trade in a narrower range that you actually increase the sensitivity. Yeah. John Paul, I'm going to just ask you to, to stop sharing screen now and, and just discuss what you've already shown us. Um, we're getting sure. shorter on time. And we hear yeah. you better when you don't do the sh screen share. Okay, sounds good. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm, uh, we're getting quite a bit of it, but certain parts of it are really difficult to understand. So it'd be sure. good if we just went back to you. And Oh, good, good shot of me there. <laughs> <laughs> I always stop screen sharing. I got frozen. Well. But you know, if anybody wants to see John Paul's work, he has a lot of his work on his website, johnpaulcapanegro.com, and it's it's stunning work. I mean, it is not like anything that I've seen anywhere else. Um, uh oh, there he's gone. <laughs> um, you know, and and it is a lot about color, but I think it's not only about color. I think he's using color in service of an idea, um, and and my take on it, and you know, I'd love to hear what you guys think is that. It doesn't really matter to me exactly what his idea is in formulating that work. What matters is, from my, you know, here as the viewer, is what it does inside me, how it makes me feel. His use of color, his use of form, um, what he decides to photograph. What do you think? Oh, and so let me just say this so that so that that work works even if John Paul isn't with us or isn't in the museum where the photo is hanging. What do you think, Karen? Uh, well, it, I mean, in answer to, um, it's interesting because I think what you just said relates to something someone was saying in the chat, which is, you know, why why analyze all this? Why not just go with, you know, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but why not just go with, you know, what you like or what you feel like? And what I'm finding fascinating is sometimes I know what I like. Like Jean Paul, when I saw your work, I hadn't I hadn't known about your work, and I absolutely love it. And I and I look at it and I think, I mean, um, everybody has their vision. You know, you have a you clearly have a vision with your work, and I have a vision with mine too. But I haven't considered every combination of every color and every contrast and every hue. So getting to hear you talk about it is so fascinating because it gives me more options. Like I hadn't thought about doing certain things this way and now I go you know back to my work and I go ooh what if I try this thing you know even if it's just playing with the other ends of the contrast to create no, a certain I totally agree. That's one of the great things about going to a museum or even uh, looking at all the images on Google Plus you see so many people's varied responses to things it gives you about it because it opens up doors um, mm -hmm. one thing that I say to that though is uh, 
I do recommend that people first do the work, find out where the key is, what, what uh, really works for them, where their passions are. And then if they've done a certain amount of, of work like that, I think you'll find that people tend to repeat themselves or stay in a certain zone. And, and that's not necessarily that. I think that's good. That, that indicates where passion is. Then at that point, once the work has announced itself, I think it's quite useful to use any of the analytical tools we have to figure out what's happening here. Because that also can help you go deeper, further, add richness. You can help figure it out. So there are times to be intuitive and uh, simply go with your gut. And there are times to be a little more thoughtful and considered. I often think of it as like breathing. You move in and out of one mode into the other with a kind of an oscillation or a frequency. Right. And I think sometimes, too, you, you, you um, take a technique and you don't really know what it's going to do, but you just go, how do I feel about this? You know? Absolutely. And that way you're using both sides. You're using your gut, but sometimes your gut could use a little more information. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times your gut can use a yeah. lot more understatement. <laughs> <laughs> and, and many times we're, we're called to do yeah. things we don't really understand. One of my favorite quotes uh, by Robert Frost is, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. So when we're called to do work, it's often a call to explore not only the richer world around us, but the depths within us and find how those two intersect. So the challenge is that we often don't know what we're doing until we've started doing it. Right. But once things have started to happen and we start to identify patterns, then we can start to figure out what's happening. It often leads us to um, that, that territory, that undiscovered territory within us. Uh, another favorite quote uh, that I like is Picasso's, an artist knows more than he thinks he knows. Add, add the she in there if you like. Uh, okay. The, the key, exactly, right? <laughs> the key <laughs> is, um, well, if we know more than we think we know, how do we get there? How do we get at that? And part of it is what Ron was talking about, permission. And part of it is uh, what you're talking about, just spontaneously exploring. And part of it is also uh, what I'm talking about, a little self-reflection to figure out what's happened and where it might lead. It's a process that's, uh, it can be really rich and really fulfilling. And, and we don't do this all alone. We, we share images. We look at other people's images. We hear what they have to say about them. We're, we're always in community. We didn't just sort of invent photography or, or art. We, we, we were born into a culture. We, we inherited a lot of things, and we're sharing a lot of things. And, and that's part of the mix, too. Mm hmm well, and that's part of the thing, too. <laughs> and we have a show that we do, Life Through the Lens, and one night I was going on about, well, more okay, more than one night, this whole notion of, and there was the book, uh, the book was written about, <laughs> no, Ron, don't start laughing at me. <laughs> it was about <laughs> the power of innovation, right? And that, and that mm. for new ideas to be born and innovations to happen, there has to be a, a, a kind of a critical mass of, of bouncing and, and energy generated by new ideas um, from other new ideas coming in, and boom, pop, pop, they start to pop and form babies. And <laughs> and yeah, absolutely. And pretty, yeah, I'm pretty soon you've got, you know, a veritable family of ideas, and that's, I just, I love that, and I think it's important never to say no. The minute you say no, it's over. Right. And I think one of the biggest things that I try and encourage uh, any of the people who come to study with me in workshops or, or seminars is stop asking the question, should, and ask what happens when. And mm -hmm. You have to be a little bit more clear and articulate about what's happening uh, in order to do that. And when you do that, you, you find your own, own way there. It's also it's much more permissive that you know, the possibility of the down. Should kind of close things down. What happens when opens things up. You know, I just mm -hmm. wanted to say, and I don't mean this to be an advertisement. This is what I really believe. If you can afford, any of you can afford to take a five-day workshop or a seven-day workshop with someone like John Paul, you know, someone who has experience bringing the art community together to create things and feed, you know, feed off each other's energy. It is the most amazing experience you can have if you're into photography and into art. Um, you know, somehow I stumbled across it in the 90s and started going up to Aspen to workshops there. And, you know, I was a lawyer. I didn't know anything about art. It's like I couldn't even draw a stick and I didn't know what I was doing there. But the feeling, the energy, the joy, I, difficult to describe. And I'm sure you know what I mean, John Paul, and Karen, and all of you who've, you know, who, 
who shoot and go on photo walks and do this with other people. It's something about that group experience that makes it huge, for me at least. So I think do it, do it, do it. Go to workshops. I agree, but um, select the ones that are led by people with a lot of passion and who want to share. Uh, they end up being the, the best workshop or, or teachers. I've had I've had some that are not so much, and I've had some people who are just on fire, and that fire is contagious and it spreads, and and that's really exciting to be around. It is, and so speaking of that, when where can we go to your workshops? You can find all of my workshops up on my webpage. Again, if you can spell my name, <laughs> then you, you can find it all, it's all in one place. Yeah, we've well, been, we've been sharing a lot of your links through the about. stream, and we've had... Uh, uh, sorry, we're I'm losing Rush. We have, about, we have about five minutes left. Um, we have so I really want to know, because what is a workshop coming up for you that you would recommend okay. to photographers? that you think is really great? I think it totally depends on what stage a person's at and what they're looking for. So if you think about coming into a lab workshop, uh, I look at something like the uh, black and white printing workshop that's coming up or anything that uh, discusses uh, the kinds of things that we talked about tonight, tonight in, in much greater detail and uh, in, with, with specific hands-on exercises. Uh, if you were Looking at uh, storytelling, wondering what to photograph, how to photograph, what mode to move in and out of, you want to be more creative with the camera, come see me out in the field at something like uh, the Arches Workshop that I'm leading soon, or uh, any one of these international travel destinations is, uh, is also exciting. So it depends on how big an adventure you want. You want to come to Iceland, I'll be there in August. You want to take a message. Oh, that's an Arches. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> oh, it is awesome. And, uh, in workshop or not, um, I, I strongly recommend everybody creates a bucket list. I did this about uh, six years ago, and uh, I listed all of the places that I wanted to go and ranked them, you know, prioritized them. Said, this is the one I really want to get to. This one, yeah, that'd be a nice one day. And uh, it's greatly increased the number of places that I've gotten to. Somehow I think these lists have just been clear gets your subconscious to start thinking about, well, how can I make this happen? And uh, to being, being clear about where you want to go is, is a great thing. So if, if you want to have adventures, start with a bucket list, and then your, your subconscious mind will automatically start thinking about ways to get there. You might even use the uh, Stuck in Customs or Stuck on Earth app to uh, get some ideas and start planning some trips. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. great. And your voice will help lead us there. It's, it's one of the things that we can start doing that. No. No, it's really John Paul, the link you may have kept it flattering you, but your voice really takes up, up a huge notch. Well, thank you very much. It's I think I'm a bit delayed. Well, thank you so much, John Paul. Really <laughs> fascinating. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Bye. Just in time. <laughs> so, what happens now, Keith? Are you going to cut us off and then we come back for informal talk? Um. Yeah, I'm going to, we'll have to end the recording, so we should say goodbye, and then I'll, I'll close the Hangout, and then restart it, and we'll have the after show in the Q&A. Okay, so we're all going to go away for a minute, and do we have to do anything, or we just wait here? Um, just wait for the new invites. Okay. Hmm. Now, that's so, probably John Paul trying to jump back in, so we should Hello, let him know. Goodbye, John oh. Hi, Dan. He's here. He's here. <laughs> This is, this is almost, almost like a Brady punch. We have these little yeah. icons. So, <laughs> so what's happening, John Paul? <laughs> yeah, exactly.